Now, thanks for staying with us. Now, women in journalism face a lot of challenges globally. For starters, the barriers of entry for African women journalists, lack of visibility, the impact of COVID-19 on East African women journalists, not forgetting that the newsroom has been described as the most hostile environment so far as sexual violence is concerned. Now, female journalists are exposed to language and action that embarrasses them sexually as they relate to the public and even with their colleagues and bosses at work. These come in ways as subtle as jokes about their feminine features. Now, just to mention a few, are you a woman in journalism uh, or you have friends or you're friends with one or you're in a relationship with one now please let us hear your struggles tell us what you're going through as you join the conversation tweet at us at plus tv africa or at waste show africa one with the hashtag waste show or you send us an sms or whatsapp to 081 803 so who is in the journalism matter how many friends do you have um, that you know they're in proper mainstream media? Let me start with Uti. I know you have plenty of them. <laughs> um, um, so again, a few, uh, just because um, I, I do a lot of radio. Um, so quite a few, but not enough. Okay. okay. So when we look at the, uh, would I say the balance of male to female gender, particularly when you come away from the lifestyle and the entertainment, when you start to go into hardcore um, topics and journalism, business news, politics, um, even just off the top of your head, if we start to, to, to you know, name the male you know, um, men in that, that field, you would come up with so many names in your mind. But when I sat here and I tried to think, I started thinking um, Oprah, Amanpour, um, mm. who else mm. in that space? So you start to try to really sort of think. Um, so yes, while I do have some friends, I think that it's, the representation is still, in my opinion, still quite low. It's still mm. very low. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the challenges, you know, the struggles that women face, you know, I've heard one woman because, you know, so it's quick for you as a woman because of your age to say, you know what, you're not ready for, you're not mm -hmm. right for this, mm -hmm. um, for this promotion. Role. You can't be the CEO of a mm. media house. They will have, a, they'll rather have a male figure. You know, they put us in roles like, okay, maybe programs director mm -hmm. or deputy, whatever, you know, yeah. you know, do things you think, like that. Do, I you, think, yeah. do you well, think that is because women are not able to actually express themselves politically in that context? No, 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 no. It's, it's not even an issue of political. It's an even issue. I'm talking about top management mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. If you look at, okay, let's even, cost, let's even call all these our top um, uh, media houses. Let's even take Nigeria, for instance, as, as a point of... Um, How many of them are yeah. left by women? How many? Except maybe the ones that you okay, case your husband that owns the... So you are mm. automatic, cosy. Even at that, you yeah. do not get the same respect yeah. that he wants. Mm. Yeah. Um, and, and I would say that if you're not in the media space, it's something that is very difficult to see. Mm. You get. Um, because sometimes when the, 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 let's say, studio wants to show the beautiful faces it will be the women but they do not take the decisions mm. yes yeah, so the decisions are not taken by the women and they, 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 they can't direct most things that happen in that space so unlike let's say sports or whatever it's just so difficult to see if you're not within that space mm. to even see the role that women play absolutely you know once um i was on our tv channel and once people called um they called us uh, a certain top shot, you know, that we are his um, girlfriends. Because at that point, we were supporting, it was the political season, and you were talking, you are supporting. So it's so quick for you to just associate a woman and say that, you know, you don't take her things, you don't take her, you don't take her words seriously. seriously. You know, you say, oh, this is pillow talk, or this is bedroom talk, mm -hmm. or whatever. And I see that play out all the time when it comes exactly. to, you know, I, even when you're talking, it's, yeah. It's, 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 I mean, there's so many things that, to, to struggle with. There's, mm -hmm. there's sexism, there's ageism. Yeah. Because you, you, you feel like there's this, you know, you have to be beautiful, you have to be young. All the time, the pressure is so pressure real, is especially real. for people in the movie industry. The men are going, but you have to. Mm -hmm. There's Botox, there's tummy talk. You just have to look young forever. <laughs> you, you, the, the men pressure. age like fine wine, and then mm. you Sean just Connery. Have to keep so even if he's 150 years old, everybody will still oh he's looking hot. But for the ladies, you gotta look good. So, so, but, but in so your real. experience with ways, maybe let me start with EC. What has been you know your challenge? You know coming into the media space. You know have you had issues like I mean because I was reading something um, the write up that um, our guest said about how you have to take permission from your husband you know do you have all of those things that is the point i don't have any of these that's why it's actually strange to me <laughs> I, I think because if i don't build by so much 
support, and I think that most of the women on ways mm. are women well, of themselves. It's, it's, it's not women really because they have a good support but structure. But th there is also, there was a time we actually had a guest on the show who actually insisted that, or uh, talked about us coming back home quite late and said, mm. oh, and your husband's actually agree. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's true. You like, know? the person yeah. was in, no. in such, like, she was amusement. in awe <laughs> yeah. that we could actually do that. So I, it's weird that we, that women are actually going through things like that. Yeah, to I've, me have had in this story. I've in had, 2020. Yes, I've had precise. a real story. Um, I started being on TV very early in life. And I remember when I finished from the university and I wanted to start up a program in some TV station in some state. Mm. Do you know that the producer or whatever just cornered me to always be by his side? Like, I just found out that he, it was intentional. So mm. people couldn't talk to me. The cameraman couldn't talk to me. I could. The day that a cameraman walked me, I think I closed late to the bus stop, they sent him on two weeks suspension because he walked me. <laughs> so that was when I realized that I was being owned oh by this goodness. person because wow. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to own a TV, a TV, a TV program, program yes. on the show. That's why I gave up work. I gave up there and I went back to... <laughs> <You're like advice. laughs> I hadn't gotten a job then, but I, I just seriously knew okay. that when I was going to say, Well, those are just, you know, just a little banter. So let me invite our guest. Dr. Yemi Siakim Bobola is an award-winning journalist, academic consultant, and co-founder of African Women in Media, a joint winner of um, the CNN African Journalist Award 2016 Sports Reporting. Her media work is Africa Focus, covering stories from rape culture in Nigeria to an investigative and data story on the trafficking of young West African football hopefuls by fake agents. Yemisi holds a PhD in media and, and cultural studies from Birmingham City University, where she is a senior lecturer and international research partnership manager. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Yemisi. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure to Such an have honor to have you. <laughs> All right, so Dr. Yemi, so you've just heard our banter on some of the challenges, you know, that women face in, um, in journalism. So in your own experience, you know, what would you say are the biggest issues when it comes to women and the media space? Well, I mean, you've already said some of the things around sexual harassment is such a big issue. Um, I've been doing some research into the barriers of entry for African women in particular into journalism. And so sexual harassment is coming up, things around gendered um, role assignments in terms of the extent to which you can cover the hard news of politics and business, et cetera. Um, but then also in terms of the parity across the different ranks and levels. So ensuring that there's more women in leadership positions. So there's things around that. There's also cultural things in terms of the position of women or the perceived position of women and how that is used against you. How the fact that you're married and you have children might be used as the reason as to why you can not do a particular role because you need to work late, for example. Um, and we've been doing some research into the impact of COVID-19 on East African women journalists in particular. And we're finding that a lot more women have been laid off so put on unpaid leave. Wow. A lot of pregnant women have wow. been put on unpaid leave. Wow. And also because now we're using a lot of um, digital tools to connect with our colleagues, you're finding that the sexual harassment is moving to WhatsApp messages, right? S suggestive sexual messages. So there's a whole range of issues that affect women that work in the media from sexual harassment right up to the kind of work that they are located. And all of these things impact on your opportunities for promotion, mm. right, for progression. Um, and, you know, this, we've done a couple of research so far and the report to be coming out in a few weeks around barriers of entry and progression and um, for women across the continent. And we're also finding that the experiences are similar across the continent, but then there's also um, some improvements in countries like South Africa, for example, where there's a lot more female editors than perhaps in Nigeria. Mm. Okay. So, um, Dr. Yemisi, um, you launched an online academy during the lockdown currently. So, um, can you enlighten us or throw more light on who, um, who is um, eligible to enroll for it? Okay. Well, I mean, let me start off by telling you about African Women in the Media. So, we are an NGO that focuses on improving the ways in which media functions relation, relating to African women, both in terms of 
women that work in the media, but also in terms of how women are represented in African in a media context, right? And so up until this year, our main activities have been around our annual conference, which tours different African countries. But then COVID-19 hit and we had to cancel our conference. But we also still wanted to have the impact. And so we partnered with UNESCO to run a series of programs, including a risk communication and community engagement training program and a Wikimedia training program. And as part of that, we developed our own learning management system called arumlearning.com. And essentially it's an online platform and um, similar to things like LinkedIn Learning or Coursera, where you can take media courses. And we started off, we did a soft launch in July with just 200 um, East African women. I said just 200, like it's not a lot, but uh, you know, just to test out the platform. But we, we found that there is a huge appetite for training and for media training, there's a huge kind of um, skills gap, particularly because our research has shown that there's a, there's a gendered nature to the allocation of opportunities for training as well. So we were lucky that we were able to provide this set of training for free. And then we hope to be launching a membership structure that would give our members free access to online media training um, as part of that membership uh, process. Okay, so I mean, I, I'd like to stay very much on um, the aspect of the female gender and race. Now, when I look across the media, I find that in international um, media houses, a lot of the female representation there, or should I say African representation there, tends to focus only on African programming. So when you find an African lady in front of the camera, she's talking about African programming. Now, what can we really start to do? Um, how can we position ourselves as black women, as African women, to really start to, I mean, it's not bad that we get that opportunity, but it would be great for us to be able to do more. So what would we, how would women start to be able to position themselves um, to be able to get um, better opportunities and, and to take on broader roles? Mm -hmm. I think, I think you know, it's one thing to talk about how should the women position themselves, but it's another thing for the organization themselves to take an active role in ensuring that they're using African female sources for news stories, for example. They have African women in front of the camera as well as in those leadership roles. So I think the first thing is for the organizations themselves to have gender policies, right? To have deliberate attempts at increasing the representation. So like you said, I live in the UK, I'm, I'm a Nigerian in diaspora, and yes, you know, you don't see many African women on TV, you don't see many African women use our sources. But in the last few months, particularly due to the Black Lives Matter movement, we've seen an increase in that. I've actually seen more Black women sources on news in the UK in this last few months than I have in the whole of the last few years, you know. And I think that's where it starts from, it starts from that deliberate effort that deliberate commitment to increase that representation. Because it's not like the women are not there. It's not like the experts are not already there. It's just to give the opportunities for them to be showcased as part of um, the representation of the society. Okay. I would like to, you know, tell the um, Uti's line, but um, particularly concentrating on your work in the African women in media. Now, it's so nice that you're doing training. I am a very big believer of capacity building because you have to be ready when the, so that when the opportunity presents itself, you can fit into that. But if we train these women and there are no, there is no opportunities, there are no opportunities for them to function in the roles that you have trained them, then the training is void. So what I would want to ask is that, how are you working with local government authorities to influence the policies that affect what, it, um, what you're doing your course? Mm. Well, thank you. That's a really good question because, like I said, it starts with the organization, the, the will to, do, to make the change. And in the last year, we've partnered with the African Union um, to organize our conferences, and we've been doing a lot more of research to look at the challenges and to look at the solutions, right? And so in that process, we've partnered with a number of media organizations and um, working with a number of the leadership and looking at it, the ways in which we can support them in developing their gender policies and their approach to addressing gender bias and um, gender inequality in their organizations. And so I think it's 
it's on multiple levels in terms of bringing in policymakers to make them more gender aware in that sense. Um, and I think there is, I mean, in Nigeria, for example, there is that lack of a gender policy. And I keep rubbing that in because, because we keep talking and pay, paying lip service to women's rights issues without actually having deliberate strategies to implement them. Um, in South Africa is a clear example of where, because they have a gender policy, you can see the direct outcome of that. Because 47% of um, editors in South African media are female, right? So you can see that by having that deliberate outline of policies, you can see the direct outcome. And so for the last um, year, in this year, we've done two pieces of research, one looking into the impact of COVID-19 on East African women, um, and the other one looking at the barriers of entry generally across the continent, um, entry in terms of actually entering the, uh, the industry, but also in terms of promotion and retention. So we hope through this research and our, and our recommendations as a result of the research, we can begin to then work more closely with individual organizations with different countries because we, we work across Africa and with the diaspora as well. So we hope we'll be able to then begin to develop programs targeting organizations on in terms of how to develop gender policies. And we're actually going to be running a training on that and um, in the beginning of next year. All right. So Dr. ABC, thank you so much. I was going to ask that um, when you said something about South Africa, I said, why, why is there an improvement? But I think you've answered that, you know, I w but I think we would, we would like to actually go deeper with South Africa to see what they're getting right. So in case the government is listening, they can also see how they can implement some of those policies um, for us here in Nigeria and hopefully in other African countries that are watching. But we'll do that right after the break. Please stay with us. <laughs> 